Hi, Val here, and this is my podcast, The Kalahari Diaries. I live in one of Africa's most remote wilderness areas. Nature and wildlife is my biggest passion. I hand-dressed Serga the lioness and walked the Kalahari to join her on her hunts. My work is on tourism and nature conservation. For fun, but also for wildlife monitoring, I fly anything that gets me into the air. I live in an old caravan. The next supermarket is a two and a half hour drive away on sandy and bumpy roads. There is no cell reception anywhere nearby, and the only comms is an extremely slow, extremely expensive satellite internet connection. I am Valentin Grüne, and this is my podcast, The Kalahari Diaries. If any of you are interested in supporting us further and becoming part of this journey, we have recently started a Patreon page where you can support us financially by signing up for a monthly donation of your choosing. You can get access to exclusive footage and updates, everything behind the scenes, what's going on here. We're trying to keep that page very informative and entertaining for everybody who just wants to feel a little bit like they share the life that we have here and at the same time become part of hopefully what will become a bit of a success in conservation in this area. You can find the link to this page under Patreon dot com slash serga and it'll also be underneath the podcast in the description thanks very much for listening this episode i would like to explain quite a lot about the kalahari in general this ecosystem and i'd like to schedule a little bit through the different seasons and for each season we're going to go through the vegetation different kinds of animals how they behave what they do and get to a little bit of a all together at the end how that whole thing makes sense and how everything is dependent from each other. And just as a little disclaimer up front, there is a lot of noise going on outside. I have no idea if that's going to be something you can hear in the background, but normally I record the podcast at night when it's very quiet. And at the moment it's daytime, but I'm just very busy and there's not much time at night. And there's lots of birds outside. There's quite a wind blowing. There's a semi-tame crow that is walking around on the roof making noise. I'm sitting in a sort of converted shipping container. So if there's any noise in the background, apologies for that. But let's get started. All right, so before we look at the different seasons in Botswana here in the Kalahari, it's probably important to just explain the general pattern of the weather here and over the year. And basically we have what we call our rainy season from about the end of November until somewhere around April. It depends very much on how good our season is in each year. And then our dry season, which goes from sort of May until about November. Now, the dry season actually should be split. There's a very warm part towards the end of the dry season before the rains arrive again. And in the beginning, after the rains stop, actually there's a fairly cold period, which means our nights get very, very cold and freezing. And the daytime temperatures are usually nice in the high 20s or mid 20s. But nighttime can be below zero quite regularly. And so I I would like to, for this podcast, just split the dry season into two sections. And the rainy season will basically just be one. Then we have our cold first beginning of the dry season, maybe what you would want to call our actual winter. And then a very, very hot dry season, which may be something like our spring And yeah, we'll look through the different animals and the vegetation for each of these times of the year. So generally speaking, Botswana does not receive a hell of a lot of rainfall. It's a desert country with the Okavango Delta in the north. And the Delta is something extremely special. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Our rainfall in general is in the north and in the very east of the country, okay we're getting around maybe 600 650 millimeters in a decent season it can also be a bit more it can be a bit less and then as we get further south and especially southwest the rainfall drops quite dramatically if we get down from the chobe mountain okavango delta region into the Khansi area next to the central kalahari game reserve then we're looking at about 300 to 400 millimeters a year. And as we go down to the southwest of Botswana, in the very corner near Tsabong or the Khalakhadi Transfrontier Park, we're getting to about 200 millimeters a year. So it varies quite a lot from the southwest up towards the north and northeast of the country. That all being said, none of that rainfall actually is enough 
to fill something like the Okavango Delta. The Okavango Delta takes huge amounts of water that are pumping through Botswana. And there's something very, very unique that happens with this whole story. And what basically is the scenario, and we're trying to do this whole thing very, very simple so that it's really easy to understand. But as Botswana receives rainfall, countries north of us have their rainy season as well, and they receive rainfall. Only those countries receive a hell of a lot more rain than us, and namely this is pretty much Angola in our case. Now, rainfall that comes down there at the same time as ours during our rainy season starts slowly filling up rivers and systems that are then leading into the Kavango River, which fills the Okavango Delta. And as that river crosses the Caprivi Strip, a part of Namibia, which is just north of Botswana, and then enters Botswana, it enters this big, big, flat Kalahari Basin landscape, which is why this delta, that water all of a sudden starts spreading out so drastically and forms the largest inland delta in the world, which is today one of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Now, all that water takes a long time to arrive. It's small rivers that fill first that then enter somehow a bigger river and eventually it, it arrives in Botswana. And by the time that water starts pumping into the Okavango Delta is actually when our rainy season is finished and when everything has started drying up quite badly. And that flood usually peaks around July and then starts dropping again. So it peaks right into the middle of our dry season and then starts receding. And once it becomes fairly small again, our rains start. Now, usually our rains are nowhere near enough to start filling the Okavango Delta at best, those rains might keep the delta at a certain level so that it, it stops receding further. But the delta actually starts flooding and pumping water into places that it otherwise would never reach when the rest of the country dries up entirely. And it's quite a big country. It's about the size of France or Texas, roughly. So it's, it's a massive area that completely dries up, has a complete lack of surface water, permanent surface water at least. And while everything gets dry from about May to November, the Okavango's Delta starts pumping water into the north of the country and some of it can actually reach relatively far south. But it's still confined to the northern section of Botswana. It reaches a lake called Lake Ngami and then one that is called Lake Kau. Now, these regions only get flooded in very good years, but it has a massive influence on our wildlife this rainfall pattern and what actually happens with the Okavango Delta is just something important to keep in mind for when we're talking about how our animals behave and what our vegetation is doing and so on. And this weird thing that that's first not something that comes to mind is that our Okavango Delta gets full of water when everything else dries up. And that is something absolutely stunning and unique and important to keep in mind. Otherwise, it becomes a bit harder to understand this whole ecosystem. What's probably important to note about the rainfall pattern in general in Botswana is that what we're getting is fairly isolated thunder showers. And they can be very big in a very, very small confined area. So we rarely get weather where larger areas of the country are actually covered with cloud that's bringing rain. It's usually a clear morning. Then as the heat comes, we have air pockets that are rising up, pushing air up creating movement and as that moist air hits the dew point big cumulonimbus clouds start forming and eventually they will offload just somewhere in one spot so you could literally stand here in this big flat open Kalahari area and just watch a massive thunderstorm in front of you if some on your sides behind you everywhere while you stay completely dry and you're under a blue sky and you can see the rain coming down just over there and your area gets absolutely nothing or obviously the other way around. The bottom line underneath that is that certain areas over this massive country might receive quite a lot of rainfall, whereas others might receive next to nothing. And obviously that makes a big difference for the animals and for the vegetation. Overall, the rainy season is a very beautiful time of the year. Although it is the low season in Botswana, I guess tourists generally are not the biggest fan of, of rain at all. But it's actually not that bad here. I mean, it's actually lucky to catch a shower. It's a desert country, so most of the time, if we get a shower every couple of weeks, we're actually quite lucky. Then that being said, sometimes we might get a week where we actually have quite a few rain showers and 
if somebody picked that specific week to come and see the Kalahari, that may not be their best experience, although a lot of absolutely magical things starts happening. And then everything becomes like a beautiful green paradise, depending on how many rains we get and how heavy the showers are in a certain area, seasonal Pools can form of water and certain areas of the Kalahari, actually relatively large pans fill into sort of little lakes, some actually bigger lakes that hold water for quite some time. And in very, very good years, if we received a lot of rain, some of them may even hold water through the entire dry season. Yeah, so let's start by looking at our vegetation in the rainy season in the Kalahari. And the vegetation basically looks like that most of our trees are already fairly green because a lot of them have water reserves stored in their roots that they then start pumping up into the tree and utilizing in anticipation of the rains arriving. So many of the trees actually start flowering and start producing their first leaves long before the rains arrive in order to prepare for this and make the most of the time when there actually are rains. Many people actually believe that looking at the trees and when they flower is a very good way to judge when the first rains would arrive because apparently the trees are way better at guessing that than humans will ever be. Now, the grasses and smaller plants only start growing as the rain actually starts because their roots and their seeds are right on the surface, which is absolutely bone dry. And most of these don't have any roots that can actually store much moisture, especially our seasonal grasses, which will regrow entirely every year from a new seed. Some other grasses, perennial species that grow over years, can grow six, seven years old, quite a few of them. They will come back every year and they do store a little bit of moisture. Some of them stay green quite long throughout the season and they can be green a little bit before the rainy season, but the brutal heat, the sun and everything usually dries up everything on the ground relatively proper before it gets green, while all the trees are already completely green, isolated dots all over the place because they're using the reserves in their root system. There are other plants that aren't really grasses, lots of different kinds of herbs and things that are around in the Kalahari. And some of them are important because they have a massive root. It's often just a small little plant. Many of them are sort of creepers or climbers that use another bush or tree to actually try and reach sunlight with just one little shoot that actually goes up and sprouts a few green leaves. But if you dig up the root system of that is a massive, massive tuber that holds many, many liters of moisture. Some of them can be a bit poisonous for humans to consume, also for animals, but many of them are actually good to consume for people as well as wildlife. So for the dry season part later, it's important to remember that these little plants that grow just anywhere in the bush are important and use that rainy season to fill up these big root systems that they have. And obviously everything, all the plants are using the rainy season to produce flowers, to produce seeds, to reproduce and make more of them and new ones the next year. Now, if our rains were just right, usually a very good rainy season and then the right amount of in the right frequencies in certain areas, one amazing plant that actually grows in the Kalahari is the Kalahari truffle. It's a white desert truffle, which is something very expensive if you get it anywhere else. But if we're lucky and we have the right year, we can literally go into the bush and just pick up kilos and kilos of this buckets full and we make a truffle lasagna or all kinds of stuff where the truffle is actually the pasta sheets or replacing the pasta sheets. So sometimes we get lucky and we have a very fancy meal and that's usually the end of a very good rainy season when those kind of things are growing. So for our animal species, if we're looking at a couple of the different herbivores to start with in the rainy season, we can start in the north where we have the elephants, the hippos and buffalo and things like that, many other antelope that are relatively water dependent and don't ever leave the permanent water of the Okavango Delta. Now, as we mentioned before, the Okavango Delta actually recedes in the rainy season, so it becomes smaller, but the rains that are happening all over the place now are actually forming little pools and lakes that make it fairly accessible for a lot of these animals to go out and utilize areas that are not by the permanent river systems of the Okavango Delta. So elephants and buffalo and other kinds of antelope like waterbuck and sable and roan antelope might start spreading away from these permanent water systems quite a bit which is another reason why our tourist season isn't perfect that time of the year because it is much harder to find our wildlife although they're probably much happier than they are in the dry season now 
that gives the vegetation around the Okavango Delta a little bit time to recover because there's a little bit less pressure on everything getting eaten and so on because the animals have moved away. So vegetation very close to the rivers and near the delta can actually utilize that time while it's raining to regrow and not have that massive impact from all the animals coming to eat. And everything is just a little bit more spread out and less concentrated around these permanent rivers. Now, our other species, Chemsbok and Springbok and Hartebeest and Irland, for example, which are not very common at all in the Okavango Delta. Many of them don't occur there at all. They're actually very much in the desert south of the Okavango Delta, occupying areas like the Central Kalahari Game Reserve and the Transfrontier National Park. Now, those animals do something very similar. They are spread out fairly properly all over the place. They're split up into smaller groups fairly often and start walking around wherever there's been a rain shower, following a little bit these patterns and enjoying the green vegetation even before the rains arrive as so many of the trees start putting out their flowers and after that sprouting their first leaves those animals are extremely healthy happy and they're utilizing the early mornings and late afternoons to feed and because they're ruminants they are regurgitating food out of their four chambered stomach back into their mouth pretty much and that way they are a very very efficient animal to utilize food and it gives them the ability to eat quite a bit in the morning, just swallow a lot, but then later just lie in the shade during the day when it's very, very hot and it would be using way too much energy to move around outside. So they will use that time to lie in the shade, regurgitate their food slowly and just relax. And yeah, in the evening they will go out again to get another load of food into their stomach. And then at nighttime, most of these animals are actually fairly awake and that's simply because of the predators being active. So many of these antelope form herds, they're happy to stand quite close together and they love open spaces where it's easier for them to actually pick up what's going on compared to standing in the middle of the bush. Although there are some species like the kudu, for example, which eats leaves mostly and no grass. And those animals are very adapted to being in more bushy areas. So you really find them in an open spot. Now we have two other species and they're very important to understand. Now that's our wildebeest and zebra. Both of these are what we call migratory species. Our zebra in Botswana are still doing Africa's longest zebra migration, which comes down from the Chobi National Park to the Makhadikhadi ecosystem, a national park along the Poteti River pretty much, which then starts filling those areas and then they walk back. Now wildebeest also migrate. Now these animals, are doing something that's fairly unique to them and a little bit different from the two different sets of species we just discussed before. They're all herbivores, obviously. The zebra, elephant, and hippo, by the way, are not ruminants. They are called handgut fermenters. They have a digestive system much closer to ours, for example. They do not that, do that regurgitating thing. And by that, they're actually much less efficient in utilizing vegetation. And compared to their body mass, they need to eat quite a lot more than a wildebeest, a chemsbok or a springbok, for example, would need. Now, all that aside, the reason that these animals migrate is to become very large in numbers. And to do that, they have to move a lot. Now, the rainy season is what we're looking at right now. And that is when these animals are having time to be absolutely pretty much everywhere. The whole of the Kalahari starts getting green, there's water all over the place, and little pools are actually putting permanent surface water in fairly many locations, but also the green vegetation itself contains a lot of moisture, which means they have to actually drink actual water a lot, a lot less. And through that, the Kalahari becomes a massive, huge open paradise that these animals can utilize. Most of these animals that would have been in the areas where there's permanent water during the dry season use the rainy season to move out into this vast ecosystems because now they can utilize vegetation everywhere. And although the Kalahari itself, the dry parts of it, become such a harsh environment once the rain stop and the water dries up, it is an ecosystem full of vegetation. And that vegetation is barely touched because there isn't that many animals. So migrating into that area when it is possible is a very, very clever thing to do. And zebra have 
to my knowledge, not gone as far and not as many as wildebeest would have ever been. But wildebeest specifically moved throughout the Kalahari all over the place. And even today, there are herds of wildebeest left in parts of the Kalahari where it's completely dry, but they're suffering quite badly throughout the dry months and they're not becoming that many anymore. But they used to be in their millions migrating through these areas and utilizing all this abundance of vegetation for their food and that's their part of the rainy season so happy times for them that's when they're having their babies and wildebeest for example are even calving while they're migrating so the females just have to pretty much drop their babies right there and it's just within minutes that that little calf stands up and it starts running with the herd obviously predators are loving this time of the year many predators are enjoying the the calving which makes easy prey for them and and all this abundance of wildlife that all of a sudden happens in the Kalahari is something fantastic for them. That brings us to our predators. Now looking at things like lion, leopard, cheetah and wild dog and so on, the rainy season is where many of them are teaching their young to hunt which means a lot of them actually have their young a little bit earlier while a wildebeest or another antelope, pretty much any of the herbivores, is trying to stay pregnant for as long as possible and then bring out a, a calf which is so fully developed that it needs almost no time to stand up and be able to run. And we know that from horses or sheep or any of those animals that we're still farming back home in our own environment. Now it's obvious that this makes sense because being born completely helpless and taking forever to even be able to walk would mean that most likely none of them would survive. They have to be able to run because they are prey to many things. Now a predator is the other way around. Any of them, lion, leopard, cheetah, wild dog, we can look at it in our domestic animals like domestic cats or our dogs at home. Their young are extremely underdeveloped, the eyes are closed, they can't walk for sometimes weeks after they're born, they're just lying and they're being completely helpless. And again, this makes a lot of sense because a predator is an animal that needs to hunt, that needs to be very fit and very active. And now being heavily pregnant and utilizing that extreme enormous amount of energy to do a hunt would physically be impossible. Therefore, the young are born very underdeveloped, but because it's a predator, it's an attack animal, is able to defend itself properly, they do look after the young, although that's not easy for them. Many things are trying to kill them, but that's how this whole thing works with the young and it makes sense. So many predators will have their young late in the dry season so that when this time comes, when a lot of the herbivores have their calves, that is when it's perfect time to teach the young the first bits of hunting and also, that's when there's an abundance of food around and that is when the young stop suckling the mother and they need their own meat, which then all fits together perfectly for that time of the year when, for example, the wildebeest start calving, which is usually around Christmas time. Yeah, so about our predators, not much more to say about them actually right now. There's a lot of different hunting techniques that many of them have and things like that, but that will come in future episodes of the podcast. For now, it's just important to understand that they utilize that time of the calving for things like the wildebeest to often raise their young. And there are many other animals that have young during that time. But the heat and everything is actually something that makes a lot of the predators suffer quite badly. They don't do well with 40 degrees in the shade, very hot nights. And I haven't seen many of them that seem to enjoy the thunder showers and thunderstorms and things like that very much. Also, if we actually think about the reality, these animals, our predators like lions, leopards or cheetah, any of them, their coloration is something that blends in perfectly with a dry Kalahari. The green Kalahari makes them stick out quite a bit more. There's a lot of flies around that are annoying to them. So many parasites that are crawling around, ticks are all over the place. And it's actually a time of the year that the predators don't necessarily prefer that much. And we need to remember that throughout the dry season, a lot of the herbivores are actually starting to suffer and they're getting quite weak, which means they're easy to catch. Plus the weather is cold, all the parasites are not here. And a predator can gain moisture just from eating the insides of an animal, the stomach content. Any animal, any herbivore that walks around here and that is alive would have, even if it's about to die from dehydration, it will still have a completely moist inside and obviously the blood and things like that. So any of the lions, leopards, cheetahs don't necessarily need to drink water at all if they can hunt regularly. 
Now, another thing that we should not forget is all our small things, our insects, small birds, and all kinds of stuff, and reptiles, which come out in our rainy season, and many of them are actually completely gone at a different state of their cycle, or in hibernation, or something like that, during the dry season. Now, as the rain starts and any moisture starts appearing and the heat comes out, many moths and butterflies and all kinds of insects and small lizards and geckos and everything starts appearing out of nowhere. A lot of these small things are very, very important for our ecosystem. For example, our dung beetles that are burying so much poop and basically fertilizing the whole of the Kalahari because of just what they do to breed and to eat from. So in our rainy season, termites start flying. They are breeding in a very amazing way actually but we don't have any time right now to get go into actually termite behavior but a lot of migratory birds arrive here little swallows that come all the way from europe the european barn swallow that just arrives here to eat termites mostly and many many other migratory species as well the white stork also that would come all the way from europe to spend some months here in africa because it's cold back home and snowy there's nothing to eat so they're sitting here when it's beautiful and rainy and wherever there's been a good rain shower these animals start showing up and they can actually show up so much when there's a swarm of termites that's actually emerging out of their dens to to reproduce the the birds that sometimes come to eat them is almost like a cloud actually covering up the sky and the noise of all the wings is absolutely stunning and incredible. So all of these things happen and it's something that is absolutely exclusive to our rainy season. And one other thing that obviously all these small insects and many of them, a good example is our honeybee, is very, very important for is the pollination of different plants that are all flowering. And by that, they're helping our vegetation to reproduce. All right, now we've discussed a few animals and a bit of the vegetation, which I think is enough at the moment. And it's time to look at the same set of, of vegetation and animals and just do that in the first part of our dry season real quickly. Now that would be the colder part, what I would call our winter, which is sort of from May until maybe August. And let's just have a look and see what these animals do during those months. Now, the beginning of this winter basically means that we get colder nights. The days are just warm, but not like deadly brutal anymore. And the clouds disappear pretty much completely. We get very few cloud cover. And yeah, colder nights as we go along. There's cold fronts coming in, but generally the nights get relatively cool. Now, towards the end of this c colder part, our winter here, the nights in the Kalahari can be absolutely freezing. We've had, I would say, two months straight this winter where every morning everything outside our bird bath and all that stuff was completely frozen. So we've had minus degrees every night for, I would say, two months straight, which was pretty impressive. I actually never had seen that before. And the coldest I've measured myself here was minus 12 degrees. So it, it does get very cold, although that being said, the day then gets, it's usually up into the mid-20s again. So the daytime is fairly nice all all of the year here in summer actually it can become a bit too hot for many people now that first part of the winter when the nights get cooler and stuff like that most of the vegetation that we need to look at again is remaining fairly green the grass should be fully grown and in seed if we had a proper rainy season and the trees completely green beautiful leaves there's lots of shade everywhere and it looks very very beautiful actually an absolutely stunning time to come and see the kalahari because the thunder showers and that stuff are not really around anymore the weather has cooled down a bit but the vegetation looks absolutely stunning and all the animals are very very fit and healthy now as we get further into this time the grasses get more brown and yellowish and have dropped most of their seeds and as we get the first frosts, usually that means the trees shed quite a few of the leaves. The grasses really now become just yellow and the Kalahari actually becomes what it is for sometimes most of the year, a fairly yellow dry landscape with sort of green trees in between here and there. Now for our grass cover, what we mentioned a little bit before earlier is that we have those annual grasses that have to completely regrow from a seed every year 
So they usually pretty much die off completely and become relatively useless as food for most of our animals. Now we have our perennial grasses, which are the ones that grow through different years. The same plant just regrows. Of course, they produce seeds as well if there was enough rain. But the plant is a little bit like a tree in a way, if you want to compare it to that. It doesn't have to regrow from a seed every year. It just stays there and grows again. And those grasses stay good throughout pretty much the entire dry season. So for our herbivores that we're coming to next, it's important that there's a lot of those perennial grasses because they just pose a good food source throughout the dry months, whereas those annual grasses simply die off and are pretty much without any value. The only time when the animals are actually eating those is early in the season when they're nice and fresh and green. Now, looking at our animals again, our big animals that belong with the water, like our elephants, hippos, buffaloes, waterbuck, sable antelope, roan antelope, and many others, they start moving back towards the Okavango Delta area because all the pools and puddles are now slowly drying up. The rains have stopped and they know if they don't move back, they're going to have a lack of water. They can't drink enough and they will suffer and eventually die. So they will start moving towards the Okavango Delta. What we should keep in mind is what we said in the very beginning, and that is the fact that the Okavango Delta starts pumping water now slowly in this first part of our dry season. The water starts pumping in, in and it's getting a little bit bigger and the area around the delta which had rain and had time to grow vegetation and a lot of the animals were not present as much also now carries beautiful vegetation so the animals that are moving back to this permanent water if the seasons were well and everything is in a nice balance should find a beautiful ecosystem full of food with water and rivers that are ex expanding and pumping further so it's a very unique and beautiful way this ecosystem works for all of these animals that are very water dependent now our migratory animals which would be the wildebeest and the zebras do the same thing as the rains stop they start moving back now although they're not so much in competition with everybody else because especially when we're looking at these huge numbers of millions and millions of wildebeest and hundreds of thousands of zebras that are grazing through these areas they have a hard time competing with the center of the delta where obviously our hippos basically stay all of the time the elephants move out a bit but they prefer to be very close to the water and to go there in those numbers wouldn't make very much sense but because the Okavango Delta starts pumping water in this time of the year, it actually starts spreading some of these arms into areas that it otherwise wouldn't reach, which are then also not really utilized by the other wildlife that usually occupies the Okavango Delta very much. So this gives the wildebeest and the zebra the opportunity to utilize river systems and lakes that are now filling up while everything else is getting dry, while they have the opportunity to utilize the vegetation that remained relatively untouched, if they're lucky, in those areas. And they're obviously trying to move slowly because the Kalahari does never lose food for them. There's plenty of grass available to eat throughout the whole year. The only thing that limits the animals from being there the whole time is the water availability. So as pools and puddles dry up and some of the seasonal pans that can last quite long sometimes even, as all of that gets more and more dry, the animals have to move further and further north and the Kalahari sort of gets empty a little bit because that migration of these many, many animals disappears and hides in the north. Actually, to the very south of Botswana, for people who are more interested in the whole thing, that migration would have gone down south towards the Orange River area rather than up north towards the Okavango Delta. So there would have been different type of migration routes for these animals. Now, if we're looking at our Hemsbok and Springbok and these Kalahari animals, including the red hearted beast and Eland, they don't have that habit of walking to permanent water. They're very adapted to living in this ecosystem in the desert without having to utilize surface water throughout the year. Obviously, they drink if they can and they absolutely love water, but they don't have to. And in order not to have that massive competition in the Okavango Delta, they pretty much decided to remain in the desert and have throughout you know evolution adapted to living there very very successfully now there's something very important that we now need to look at and they don't just stay there and eat they also migrate they don't migrate necessarily to the same spot like the wildebeest would have done or back to the water like the elephants or the buffalo herds would be doing it 
they will migrate throughout the Kalahari to areas that receive the absolute most rainfall because they will now arrive in a place where although there is no permanent surface water in form of a, a puddle or a river or a lake or anything like that available but there is a lot of moisture available in the vegetation and the more we get into this dry season into our winter the more important it becomes for these animals to be in these areas in order to be able to dig out these big tubers that contain water and to simply eat vegetation that is relatively juicy and for us that pretty much means anything that's still relatively green so the availability of water for these desert animals doesn't mean there has to be a river or a lake but it definitely means that there has to be water available in the vegetation and that can only be where we had good rain some areas get so utterly dry it can even look like they've burned just from the sun and they just didn't receive any rainfall other areas can look relatively beautiful and green, full of food throughout most of the winter. And obviously that is areas where slowly a lot of these desert animals will start focusing on. So their migration is not, you know, confined to one area like it is for the other animals that utilize the Okavango Delta or the rivers and lakes that start flooding out of it in our dry season. But the Kalahari wildlife, our elands, Chemsbok, Springbok and Hartebeest and so on, utilize these spots in the Kalahari where there have been very, very good rain showers. And doing that is a very important habit for them. Without, many of them would probably start dying. Now looking at our predators again, lion, leopard, cheetah, and so on, they stick around where prey moves. They change their behavior a bit because the big herds are not there anymore. The weather is now much, much cooler, so they can hunt longer into the day. They're actually enjoying this time a lot. And wild dogs will start digging their dens and have their babies around June, July, and lions do the same thing, often start breeding in that time of the year. We've just recently now, over the last winter here, seen our leopard have several cubs in our area. So it's a time where the predators are fairly happy. The heat is not exhausting them too much anymore. There's usually prey around. And although predators do move with prey in certain ways and lions specifically or wild dogs could have massive territories in the Kalahari ecosystem they do stick to certain areas that they call home and where they actually settle in and they pretty much stay, stay there throughout the year and just deal with the change in the season. Now if we look at all our small stuff most of the insects they start hiding because it's getting colder the reptiles go into hibernation the birds many of them leave like our migratory swallows and white storks and stuff like that are on the way back home to Europe where they're going to spend the summer and the, well, most of the year actually in a in a perfect habitat for them. And here it just becomes too dry. Now another bird and actually quite an important one is our vultures. And this dry season is when the vultures start building their nests. Now vultures have abilities to travel through entire countries in southern Africa within months. So their habitat literally covers so much it's incredible to even think of. But for a certain time of the year, and that's quite a few months of the year, the vultures are confined in a way to a certain area because they want to raise their young. And that is the dry season. And it makes sense because now the vultures are hopefully healthy and fit and they're building a nest. They put an egg in the nest and they care for the egg. And vultures are not hunters. So they are completely dependent on dead animals, on carcasses. Obviously having lions and many other predators around gives opportunity for leftovers. But the time of the year when there is an abundance of meat is usually towards the end of our dry season when many animals that haven't been able to get the right food and actually make it in this tough ecosystem are now too skinny and are dying. And that is a time when the vultures are able to feed their, their chicks a lot. And that is how their system works and then throughout that time at the end of our dry season when it's very hot they can feed their babies a lot and they can grow up and start flying that was pretty much that colder part of our seasons which i would really call our winter now that hot part of the dry season which is basically september to november actually the time we're in at the moment is very windy very dusty the cold nights stop and a brutal brutal heat starts and it can literally go from one week where it's still minus five minus six in the mornings to a time where all of a sudden the days are in the 30s the nights are almost at 20 degrees and that heat just starts coming and you can feel how how the weather is really changing now many many 
trees now completely shed their leaves with a lot of that wind but at the same time quite a few other trees are starting to flower which is usually first our acacia mellifera a smaller sort of shrubbish tree that starts putting beautiful white flowers out everywhere and then we get our acacia areoloba which is the camel thorn tree a very sort of popular tree in africa that that grows a lot here and is quite iconic and those ones start putting little yellow flowers out and they actually stay green throughout most of the year unless we have a very, very bad year with very little rain. And that's just how slowly before any rain arrives, but with that warmth, many of the woody plants, the trees specifically, start producing their flowers and many of them will, after the flowers, start producing seeds as well as leaves. And that gives the Kalahari the appearance of a very, very dry, dry grass cover on the bottom or just sand in many areas. And then very green trees that are popping out everywhere it looks very amazing, actually. And yeah, that's what happens to the vegetation. On top of that, this heat is something that is very, very indescribable if no one's ever experienced it. So the vegetation also suffers from that. And sometimes you can see that vegetation is trying to get somewhere and do it, but the sun is just too brutal and it actually just kills everything that's happening to the tree. And then the they most likely have to wait for the actual rain to come to start their cycle again because they won't have any other wood reserves left. Our animals in this time are now obviously very focused around the water. We can look again at our delta animals, the elephants and hippos. They are obviously enjoying the flood coming in. It's beautiful for this, this part of the ecosystem that these animals can now sit in their water. The rivers are big and they're having a good time but it is very, very hot. And aside from the animals that are actually in the water a lot, many animals suffer simply from this heat. Sometimes birds fall out of a tree just because of heat stroke. We found a big secretary bird and a big eagle last year that were that had a bit of a heat stroke just sitting somewhere. And we've taken them and you know wrapped them in a cool towel and, and put them in the shade somewhere. And usually by in the afternoon and they eat something and drink something, then they can fly again. But it's just a very rough time of the year, this sort of last part of the dry season. Unless you really love heat, I wouldn't recommend coming to Botswana at, in, at that time of the year, sort of from now till November. is a very hard time to actually be here. Although it's also something amazing to see all the dust devils, all the trees starting to flower. Personally, I, I love, I think, any season of the year here. But I think for most people, this may be the toughest time to be in the country. Now, looking at the other animals, our wildebeest and zebra, obviously they would now be very focused on these last places where the water is pumping because they wouldn't be able to drink anywhere else and they have to drink almost every day. Now, those places namely would be, again, what we mentioned earlier, there would be Lake Ngami and Lake Kao, which are the two lakes that basically is furthest south and sort of a bit to the southeast that the Okavango Delta can pump water. Now, because there is no other water available, that's where these animals, the migratory water-dependent animals, mainly wildebeest and zebra, would start sticking around. Now, that being said, there might be years where some areas in the Kalahari, like for example the Khansi region, but even the Tsabong area, actually can carry water throughout the entire year if it has been an exceptionally good rainy season. In Sabong, for example, it is springs that come out of the foot of a little hill. That hill somehow fills up with water and must have some sort of a very solid basin underneath, which then actually starts leaking water and forming a natural spring that fills up quite a few ponds and pools around these little hills if the rainy season had been good enough. And Khansi has very many areas that are just big pans with a fairly solid calcrete base that fill up with water. And if they got enough water, they can hold water throughout the entire season. So in years like that, it is likely that many of the migratory animals would have actually stuck around in certain areas in the Kalahari and not migrated back all the way to the Okavango Delta in the north or maybe to the Orange River system in the south. Our other animals, Chemsbok, Springbok and the rest of the desert species, they are now very dependent on the water and on these areas where it had rained a lot. It is a very, very tough time for many animals in the Kalahari. Quite a few of them get a bit skinny, they get a bit sick. This is the time now when the predators are flourishing, the vultures are feeding their babies. So everything has its purpose and its balance, but it can be quite brutal to see these animals suffering in the heat at the end of this dry season before the rains come back. But 
Hemsbok, which is probably the most iconic desert species that we have here, is an incredibly tough animal. And I can personally not even imagine how many of these animals can just live here. It's stunning. You can see them in a terrible year with absolutely no rain. And they just stand there looking healthy, fat and beautiful. And they're extremely well adapted to living in this dry, hot time of the year without having any problems. And yeah, we've just sort of gotten into it a little bit. Lion, leopard, cheetah and co. They're obviously having a good time now. That's when many of them start to have their, their cubs and pubs. And hunting is relatively easy because many of the animals may be weak. It is also a way of natural selection. The weakest animals are the ones that get skinny first or maybe one that's already a bit sick is definitely not going to make it through this tough time. And now as a lion or a cheetah approaches a herd of prey, whatever it may be, as they start running away, and even before they run, these predators are extremely good at singling out the one animal that is a bit weak, that looks a bit, you know, like it's limping or like it's skinny, and it will be the one they catch because it will be the slowest as they start their chase. So this way nature sorts out the weak gene genes and maybe something slightly crippled or the old and sick. Now, all our small things are starting to come out with this hot part of the dry season. This is when the insects are starting to appear. As soon as the frost at night stops, the insects are all over the place. You turn on a light at night and it starts being covered in moths. And where they really come from is, seems like a mystery sometimes, but everything sort of comes alive. The snakes start coming out. They're quite active that time when it starts getting warm because they've had a long time where they're may have not eaten anything for many months and they're now back out starting to hunt mostly they're after little mice and and little you know all kinds of little other animals and Serga is joining us here in the background And the crow is jumping around on the roof, so everything is going on outside. It's actually rare for sugar to roar during the daytime. Yeah, so all these small things are just magically appearing with the little lizards running around and, and everything coming back out and being absolutely desperate for water despite them all being active in this hot part and just appearing out of nowhere. As soon as you drizzle some water onto the ground somewhere at the moment, a lizard will come running and just sit in it we have a little bit of, of grass that I water outside and some plants that we're growing. And as soon as we water them, all these little animals are coming and we have the bird bath outside and, and things. So water is something that is an absolute hub of life, especially in this time of the year in the Kalahari Desert. Now with this warm weather, some of our more uh, regional migratory birds arrive, for example, the yellow-billed kite. We get these strong winds, lots of dust storms, lots of dirt devils, sometimes an actual sort of real sandstorm can happen here. And the heat of all makes everything just a bit of a struggle. And as we get into November, sometimes even all the way into December, our rains start arriving again. And that's when many of the antelope raise their young. The predator cubs are now a bit bigger and they start learning to hunt, which is usually what happens with the, with the young of the wildebeest and stuff like that, for example. The vulture chicks should be now flying. And a lot of other migratory birds like the European swallow will arrive. Our grass starts growing again and the whole thing starts over and over. At the same time, the flood that so magically filled up the north of Botswana with water starts receding, although the area is starting to receive its first rains. And the pans in the Kalahari start filling up again, and a little bit of green starts coming out here and there, which gives those animals like the wildebeest the ability to start moving back into the normally dry parts of the Kalahari. And our whole cycle for the next year is now starting again. So looking at this picture a little bit overall, I think what becomes quite apparent is that there's something so special and unique happening here in the Kalahari with this way that the north gets so much water in the dry season. So the rainfall versus the flooding pattern of the delta region and 
everything else is an absolutely amazing feature and such a unique beautiful thing that should absolutely be protected because it's such a massive ecosystem that somehow works by itself and the other thing that i think is important to keep in mind here is that we look at these areas in the Kalahari sometimes, and if we look, for example, at Central Kalahari Game Reserve alone, which is actually surrounded by many other wildlife areas, and then the Kalahari Trans Frontier Park, again surrounded by wildlife areas, these actually sort of connect the two parks almost. And if we're taking just Central Kalahari with 52,800 square kilometers, it's larger than Denmark, and it's just one game reserve in Botswana. It is absolutely massive, but to be completely honest, we need space and that is so important. And I think it's something that we, you know, we have to keep in mind. Anybody actually interested, maybe grab them or go on Google, grab a map somewhere on Google of Botswana, where you can see those national parks and you'll see how big they are. But even though they're very, very big, maybe a lot of this part that's green, that's part of the national park, did not receive that big rains. Maybe they just happened somewhere in between the two parks, which now means a lot of the wildlife is going to try to migrate out of the parks into other areas. And because of this very sporadic and isolated rainfall patterns, it is very important for our animals, specifically for the ones that have no access to surface water, to be able to move within this massive area to find the spots where they are able to survive the dry season. And in that way, this enormous space in the Kalahari is something that has to be protected and cannot be taken away. And more than anything, a threat to wildlife here at the moment is the fragmentation of habitat and the, you know, the cutting off of natural migration routes. And my podcast episode number four actually talks about how this migration disappeared and all the things that happened. But that's something we don't want to get into this time. This is just about the Kalahari and how it's actually supposed to be working. So I think as a conclusion, we can obviously say that water dictates life, even in a desert that has almost no surface water, but a lot of water in its vegetation, and then a lot of water sometimes on the surface when our rains are big enough. And on top of that, what's also important to realize is that many, many animals completely depend on each other. And... Just as a little example here to finish this off, if we just look at something like termites, termites in mass apparently make up more than all humans on this earth. Now, just imagining how many termites it would take to make up one human being is already amazing. And then imagining that there are actually more in mass around here is absolutely stunning. And imagining the impact that they have because they are digesting dead organic materials. They're growing fungus with it that they're then eating. And it's just outstanding this 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 thing that nobody probably even thinks of now that there's so many of them obviously means there are a massive food source for so many others but at the same time i believe the impact that they may have on our vegetation on the fertilization of our soils is absolutely incredible and it should make us think twice about can we spray pesticides and things like that at the same time there are other things that not many people may have realized yet which is for example that something like a lion or a bear or whatever or wolf anything that's on the top of the food chain not like the termites more in the bottom but anything that comes from the top of the food chain can be just as important and it has a very very interesting effect it's something called trophic cascades and it could be for example that we have one area where there's beautiful grass and beautiful bit of water and everything, and all the animals want to go there. But if we let them go there without anything stopping them from doing that and from spending too much time there, the animals will completely trash all the vegetation that exists. They will eat everything. None of the grasses will ever get a chance to produce a seed because it will get eaten as soon as it comes out of the ground. Now, just think about the potential that it may have to say there is a resident lion pride near that waterhole. Animals will still have to come utilize the waterhole and the lions will definitely use that chance to make a kill, but it would keep a lot of the prey, which is eating the grasses, generally away from the water. And they might come drink quickly, but then run off again because they know the lion is sitting somewhere and they can smell it and all of this stuff. So the lion might actually have an impact on the grasses around this certain area, even if it's not a waterhole the lion will go where those animals are focusing and not letting them be the whole time where they might want to be is actually something that is good for them at the end of the day because now these good grasses have a chance to reproduce and not get eaten too much. Now, this is just an example, something that's actually not scientifically reported as or, 
or studied as far as I know. But something that has been studied on this regard is not in this ecosystem, but in Yellowstone National Park where wolves were reintroduced. Some of you may have seen this. Actually, it's a quite a popular video on YouTube, but I'm going to put a link underneath the podcast here. It is called How Wolves Change Rivers. And that is that thing about the top of the food chain like a predator and how this effect of the predator trickles down right to the bottom and actually has a very positive effect on the rest of the ecosystem and specifically the very bottom of it. It's called a trophic cascade and I think the video is something that just can give an idea of how important the role of that predator may be in an ecosystem and at the same time we need to remember how important the very base of this ecosystem like just for example our termites may be and how important it is that our climate works and that our climate stays the way it is and how many animals and how many ecosystems might completely fall out of its balance if our rainfall patterns and things like that would be to change too much at all. So I hope you guys got a bit of an idea about the Kalahari, how everything works. As always, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. Very happy to address those, and I hope that people enjoyed this podcast. The next episode is going to be about nothing too scientific or about an ecosystem. It's simply going to be about Serga again. I would actually like to speak about how it was like to move Serga from her old home in the Khansi region on an 850-kilometer journey through the Kalahari into her new area in the southwest of Botswana and actually one of the driest parts of the Kalahari Desert here in Botswana. And it was quite an adventure and I hope you're looking forward to the next episode. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Kalahari Diaries. Did you enjoy the podcast? Fantastic. You can help me tremendously by subscribing and rating it on your podcast app. Leave a review and tell friends and family about it if you feel like it. If you want to know more about this story, go ahead and check out the website on sergathelioness.com or follow me on social media. You'll find me on Instagram and Facebook at Val Grüner, that is at V-A-L-G-R-U-E-N-E-R, and at Modisa Wildlife Project, where I'm sharing photos and videos from the Kalahari on a regular basis. I'm Val, and you've been listening to the Kalahari Diaries. 